I guess I'll say continue that. Okay, got it. Okay. So I think that when I look to younger folks like you who are not, your blinders are still out here. Okay, my blinders are in. I do a, I do a pretty good job of trying to keep them, push them out. But over time, we tend to come in with our blinders. And I need folks like yourselves to help me and other senior leaders look look you know, look beyond, uh, you know, our normal peripheral vision for other opportunities, okay? And so this brief that I put together is kind of about this, and, and really it's it's the compelling story of why we need to reimagine the animal power. So if we could pull the slides up, someone else I think is, is running the slides there. If you could go to the first slide, um, I don't see them, they threw up, somebody can let me know, but there they are, okay. Go to the, go to the first, the next slide. Okay, so just real quick who, who I am or who we are. So I, I actually lead something called the Naval Research Enterprise, and that's comprised of ONR, Office of Naval Research, another organization called ONR Global with, with organizations in London, Japan, and uh, small uh, continuous of people in embassies around the world in locations where a lot of science and technology is being studied that we think is relevant to naval applications. And we're there in those locations to be the partner of choice before China, before Russia, before anyone else. We wanna be the partner of choice in those regions. I also lead the Naval Research Laboratory, uh, which is actually in, in 2023 will be 100 years old. This is, it has a long story history. And in fact, I think you all have Safi Bacall coming to speak. Is, is that true, is he coming? Safi shot me a note. He's with us tonight. Uh, I'm oh, Safi, uh, uh, Safi's uh, awesome. right now. So yeah. I've become good friends with Safi. And uh, if you haven't read his book, Moonshots, uh, highly, highly commend it to you. Great read. And, but he talks about the Naval Research Lab. Um, again, that'll be 100 years old here in 2023. And then I've got this other organization down the bottom right, PMR 51. They do a lot of classified work, which I'm not going to go into here. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so the way I kind of divvy up my portfolio, and I don't want to spend a lot of time with this, but the top left is a division that does all kind of cyber electronic warfare things, um, a little bit of AI, but really mostly electronic warfare areas. The next area, ocean battle space, uh, a lot you can see an un unmanned underwater vehicle there, a UUV. We do submarine applications in that area. We do ocean oceanographic research in that area. We still take a great deal of pride in really understanding and knowing the ocean environment. Uh, you know. Of course, as a submarine, that's critical, but but really everything from the weather, um, you know, the, the way our forces have to flow, optimizing transit routes, all depends on currents, winds, weather. We, we use those factors to help us and also to determine what the what the potential adversaries might or might not do. Uh, so all that goes into calculus of how we position our forces. And in the middle, you've got the mission capable, persistent, survivable naval platforms. That's an aircraft carrier you're looking at there, obviously. Uh, this division is looking primarily at a lot of the you know, a lot of the systems that are on our, our platforms, so pumps, valves, uh, material science, uh, corrosion, a lot of things that, uh, you know, a lot of people don't think about, but there's still some science to be done in perfecting some of those really sometimes dull and tedious systems, but they're critical to the operations of these platforms. And so this, this, uh, this branch looks at a lot of maintenance practices, trying to make sure we perfect those. Warfighter performance, this is actually a really interesting group. So this is a group that is looking at, um, how the human body responds to stress, how we can optimize performance of the human body in combat or in other stressful scenarios, how the human brain works, how we think. I've got a group of decision scientists in this group uh, that, that I think actually are onto something that, that I think that we may get after in some of the discussions. Uh, because when I look at reimagining naval power, I think a lot of that is not about things it's about processes, it's, it's about how we present information, it's about how we process information, how we use machines to help us make decisions. So this, this group, uh, you know, they traditionally have not had kind of the, you know, if you think about our, my group, the underwater on submarine folks, obviously a lot of focus, electronic warfare, a lot of focus, even the aviation group, a lot of focus. Warfighter performance, traditionally not as much focus, but I think there's something in this group that we really need to go after. And it's how the human brain operates and how we can uh, optimize our systems to ensure that we, we, and I'm talking about my Navy, the US Navy, maintains the advantage over every other Navy by improving the way we can process information and make the decisions faster than the adversary. And I think that's critical. Agility is the key to success, I think, in this century. The far right, as I just mentioned, aviation. So obviously jets, uh, missiles, uh, also directed energy. So you may have heard of our railgun. Railguns in this area, 
hypervelocity projectiles, hypersonics, that's, that's that far right. And then across the very bottom there, Naval Accelerator, uh, Rich Carlin, and I think some of you know Dr. Carlin, he, he may be on here tonight as well. Uh, Rich runs a group called the Naval Accelerator Group. And so this group is, is trying to figure out how do, we, how do we go faster getting things to the fleet from an ideation you know, to a, to a thing, to a war fighter. How do we do that faster than anybody else? And so Rich spends a lot of time in that space. Uh, he spends a lot of time with you guys hacking for defense ideas that come out of that, uh, as well as looking actually at maybe venture capital is, a, is something we may want to dabble in. So that's an area we, we have not traditionally explored in the past. Uh, I think there might be something there. So we're looking at that as well. So it's a lot of exciting, exciting areas here. Let's go to the, the next slide, please. All right, so this is kind of the, the why, the, the kind of the compelling case. So this comes out of a book called The Second Machine Age. Um, I read this book probably about 10 years ago now. CNO Richardson, actually right before he became CNO, we were having a, I was a brand new one star. And uh, so it wasn't 10 years ago, that was I don't know, seven years ago, whatever. But but having a great conversation with him about technology. And I was just describing some of my uh so some of my unease, the way I was talking about 1994 and what I felt going back to my submarine and after seeing MIT versus that, I was talking about the pace of change. And he said, hey, you, you're describing actually the second machine age. I'm like, oh, really? What's that? So anyway, he, he said, you need to go read that. And he come back and see me on Monday. I was like, yeah, yes, sir. So I did. We had a great conversation. But this graphic comes out of that book. And what we're getting after here, the left side of this graphic is something called the Human Social Development Index. Um, think of that as kind of your capacity for doing, okay? So if you go back to the, the graph here, 8,000 BC, okay? Think about the day, okay, you got up. What's job one? Probably hungry. So finding food is probably job one. That probably took you all day, okay? So by the time you found food, it's time for job two, find shelter. Because if you don't find shelter, job three happens, you become food. So you got to prevent becoming food. So those are three things that took like your entire life. And so as a result of that, there's a fourth thing that didn't happen very often. And, and you can tell that because the population didn't go up very fast. So that was kind of what you did as a human 8,000 BC. It was all about survival. That's all you could do. Look at the graph. So population is low, human social development index is low. The right side of the graph is population. So human population is pretty much flat line in low level millions for a long time. We've been around for about roughly 200,000 years. Planet's about 4 billion years old, 200,000 years, Homo sapiens. Uh, 10,000 years ago, we kind of figured out agriculture, which allowed us to do something very important, which was to store energy in the form of food that you could transport with you. So you could start becoming nomadic, moving around the country, moving around the planet. Um, and as you did that, uh, even as you did that, rather, the population still remained low because now you're dispersed. You probably had some places where populations may have gone up, other places probably didn't do so well. But bottom line is that population stayed low, your, your ability for doing things stayed low. But while there was some perturbations, a little bit upticks, you know, here around the zero and, you know, 1000, 1000 AD, wasn't really until the late 1700s, until we actually conquered a machine and we devised a machine and we built it to do the work of many human beings, okay? So prior to this time, we may have had you know, horses or cows doing some kind of work, domesticated animals. We may have had a water wheel here or there, or maybe a wind, you know, some wind energy, but really that was not very reliable because of energy, because of, because of the environmental factors, wasn't very transportable. It wasn't until the steam engine that we really came up with a way to reliably, repeatedly do work of many, many people. And so what did that give us? So for the first time in really human history, we all of a sudden had time. We had the luxury of time on our hands to do thinking, to really ponder ideas. And that allowed us to come up with bigger and better ideas. And if you just look at the, the 1800s, the number of kind of innovations is astounding. And that continued into the 1900s. And I, I think it continues to this day. I mean, just go back to the 1800s. I mean, clearly if I think about naval applications, you went from cannonballs to rifled barrels, to projectiles that you could shoot, you know, long ranges more accurately. You went from, you know, wind to steam propulsion, first with coal, then eventually with oil, and then, you know, eventually nuclear power. You came up with, you know, carbon, you know, internal combustion engines, diesel engines. I mean, it just, it goes on and on. Obviously electrification, refrigeration. 
People don't think about that. Refrigeration was huge in the middle of the 1800s. Again, another thing where you could now store food. And now you eliminate a lot of health hazards associated with food. And so the deaths associated with botulism and other foodborne inter- illnesses dropped dramatically. So another huge uptick in the ability to, to thrive and live longer lives and expand the population. So anyway, a great deal of things happened that drove that social development index up as well as human population up. Today, we're roughly 7.8 or so billion. Uh, we're going to be at about 9 billion mid-century. You know, all projections show it's going about 11 billion by the end of the century before we actually start coming down. Um, that is obviously going to put a lot of stress and strains on the planet. Uh, you know, water, food resources. And then that's also in competition with, uh, you know, what's happening with the global climate. You know, the temperature's going up, you know, water levels are rising, changing weather patterns. So there's likely to be tremendous stress and strains on the planet, uh, as well as on our geopolitical systems as uh, droughts occur in places they haven't occurred before. Human migrations occur to, to go to places with more abundant water or food. Uh, let me tell you, folks, put your seatbelt on because I think it's going to get exciting here kind of probably another 20, 30 years when it comes to all this, this impact of, of things just like the weather, you know, stuff that we usually take for granted. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, this slide, I, I want to show you this slide because this is, this is a decision-making framework. And so this is something called the Canefin. So C-Y-N-E-F-I-N is Canefin. It's a Welsh word. Uh, a gentleman by the name of David Snowden, an IBM researcher, came up with this framework back in the late 90s. And if you just start in the bottom right, so this is kind of the world of, of elementary school, folks. Uh, simple. It's very much how we learn things. You sense, um, you categorize what you see in your brain, uh, and then you respond. So you know, mathematics, I mean, you, you put a put a marble on the table, you put two more marbles on the table. And so you sense it, you categorize it, and you know in your head that's three marbles. So it's it's very intuitive. Uh, again, this is, I think, tempor- you know, in our lives, it's temporarily when you're kind of an elementary school to just maybe starting middle school. I think historically, I think probably we're in this, I think we were probably in this kind of world until probably you know, somewhere around the beginning of the Industrial Revolution before it started getting a little more complicated. That's the top right. So in the complicated arena, you have to actually sense, uh, sense the world around you, analyze what you, what you sense, and then respond accordingly. This is the area of what I call subject matter experts. So this is the world where you're standing at your sink and you, you sense water dripping on your toes and you open the, you know, the cupboard below the sink and you analyze the situation, you see water dripping out of a pipe and you can respond in a couple of ways. One might be to pick up the phone and call the plumber. If you're you know, handy, you might go down and get the wrench and go do it yourself. But you, you get an expert. You, you may be the expert or you may get an expert to help you solve this problem. This, I think, is the world that you know, most of us grew up in middle high school. You know, and I think uh, kind of temporarily or societally, I think this is back even when I was a junior officer. I think things were still complicated. I think we they were still solvable. You could always kind of go find the person to go solve the problem. You could find that expert. Uh, but then when you move to the top left, the complex arena, this is a little, this is different. Okay. This is an area where uh, there's not one expert to solve the problem. It may take many experts. And you may not even know really what the problem is until you probe you probe the system, you push on the balloon, you see how does, it, how does it react? So you sense that reaction and then you respond. And your first response may be wrong. So you have to respond, you have to kind of sense, probe sense, respond again until you gotta get it right. Or you bring in a team of folks to go solve this problem. I think most of our systems today are complex. Um, it's not as intuitive, it's, it's not intuitive it's, at, at all. Complicated can still be intuitive if you're that expert, um, but complex, this, this, is, this is a challenging arena. The bottom left is chaos, I mean, chaotic arena. This is 9-11, okay? Nobody knows what the hell's going on. Uh, there's chaos reigning, obviously, in the streets of New York, Washington, D.C., air, you know, up, up in the air. Uh, so in this kind of world, you have to take action, decisive action. So in the case of 9-11, what do we do? Land every plane in North American airspace now, any plane entering airspace, send them to Canada or send them home if they got enough fuel. Everybody on the ground now. You sense. Okay, no other attacks. No other planes are crashing. We had our four, the four happened, nothing else happened. And then you respond. So over the course of days and weeks, we slowly open airspace. We open the bridges in and out of New York, bridges in and out of DC. 
Uh, but it, this this is a world. I think I think the novel coronavirus actually might be in this this arena. I think history will will judge on that later. I won't try to judge it now. But but I think that's the, I think that's chaotic as well. In uh, uh, kind of underpinning all this in the middle is is disorder. If if you do nothing, it's kind of disorder. That's you know entropy kind of thing. But I think it's important to understand this because if you if you think you're in complicated, but you you act like you're in simple, you. you you're going to be really frustrated and you're going to waste a lot of time until you either trip upon the solution or it just it changes into a complicated problem and then then you can solve it so you've got to know kind of where you are in this arena if you're in chaotic you, you can't go right from chaotic to simple you have to go back to complex complicated down to simple okay it's a really interesting way to think about problem sets but again you kind of have to know where you are to solve a lot of the problem sets we're in today uh next slide please Okay, so I think you guys uh, have read a book or maybe had an assignment to read a book. And I think I've, I've got it actually somewhere here in front of me. And I think you've got Christian coming in to see you here sometimes, maybe soon. So I actually just read it as well, Kill Chain. Uh, fascinating read. I uh, read it over, I uh, took a little leave here back in August. And I read it, you know, in a couple sittings. Uh, and as I read through this book, it really, it really resonated with me. And it, it resonated with me from that kind of the last two slides. Because I really think this is the world we're in today, and and we still, I think, tend to think about the problem set as for for the naval officer. Well, I'll just go get a better destroyer. I'll just go get another aircraft carrier or a or a bigger, faster submarine. And I don't think that's I don't think that's the solution. I think Chris gets after it in this book, and so um, I hope you've read it, or if you haven't, you know, get hot because it's 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 a great read, and uh, you, you'll enjoy talking to him as well. Yet. But this quote out of the book I thought was really interesting. So military innovation is less about technology than about operational and organizational transformation. Okay, so you may think, wow, you're the chief of naval research and you're, you're saying that it's less about technology? Yeah, I kind of am. I mean, this kind of gets after what I was saying. When I say reimagine naval power, I'm not necessarily talking about new big gray hole ships or black submarines. I'm talking about changing our processes. I'm changing about the way we think, the way we're organized. I truly think a lot of the problems we have in acquisition today and trying to go after these new technologies is because the way we're organized, the way the Navy's established separate system commands, one for air, one for sea systems, one for kind of cyber systems, supply over here, they're separate. There's, there's friction between all these different syscoms. As a result of that, uh, you know, you get stovepipes, and you get you get barriers, and that impedes progress. And so, I think some of getting after reimagining naval power, we have to actually look in the mirror and recognize we need to change some things organizationally. And I think that's a huge part of this that I think people are just starting to come to the realization of that. We, you know, it, this is not 1994 anymore. We've got to change the way we do business based on that. Let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so uh, Admiral Chester Nimitz is a uh, you know big hero. I've been done a lot of reading on him. I actually got the Nimitz book I'm reading over here right now. Um, this is actually kind of interesting. So he said this in December of 1946 or 45, rather. He just become CNO. We just won World War II, uh, and we had at that time we had the largest navy on the planet. Uh, you know, and it was orders of magnitude above every other planet, every other navy on the planet, really all navies combined. And he made this quote, what the future navy will be like, we cannot say as yet. That's pretty amazing. I mean, when he said that, just for reference, he had, to, he had 28 aircraft carriers, 70 escort carriers, 22 heavy cruisers, 48 light cruisers, two large cruisers, 373 destroyers, 365 destroyer escorts, 240 submarines, and like 24 battleships. <laughs> and he says this, and he goes on to say, um, he makes a, he discusses kind of future. He says the future uh, may be driven by jet powered atomic missiles instead of 16 inch shells. It may include carrier launching radar and target directed jet missiles instead of man piloted airplanes. It may even include submarines at very high speed, both surface and submerged, making long voyages far beneath the sea. I mean, he just goes on about these future technologies, some of which have not even you know, come to fruition yet. Uh, but he goes on to say, uh, yes, there will always be a Navy but not necessarily a Navy of battleships or submarines or carriers, but a Navy in the sense of what the word Navy truly means. Mobile organization using the ocean highways, carrying its own defenses against any weapon directed against it by the enemy and launching from its mobile platform, whatever missiles, rockets, planes, atomic bombs, or anything else that the Navy as an organization of men and minds has been able to conceive of out of the limitless possibilities of science, research, and endeavor. So 
he's my hero. He referenced science is right, right there. And, uh, and he, he, I mean, visionary man right there at that point, 1945, December. Uh, next slide. That's my get off the stage slide. So um, again, if you've got more questions about O&R or NRL, there's my websites. You can check those out, all kinds of really cool tech. Just look at this picture real quick. In the center there, that's an unmanned surface vessel. Okay, that's Sea Hunter. Okay. Now you might look at it and go, hey, but there's like a pilot house right there with a window and it looks like that's where a person would stand. Yeah, you're right. So when we made this thing, we were not yet con confident that we could actually uh, get it in and out of port without, you know, having humans on still. And in fact, even to this day, we still put people on it to get it out the sea buoy and then we take, take them off. That is going to slowly change over time. Uh, um, Top left is a, uh, a rail gun shooting a projectile. Middle left is a, is a bunch of UAVs being launched in a swarm. So, you know, that this was like a dozen, but I, I envisioned launching hundreds of those things that confuse and confound the adversary. Um, bottom left is a bunch of unmanned surface vessels and also some auto, auto target recognition software for those red boxes on it. Bottom right is a rail gun. And uh, kind of the bottom middle left is the, is the laser we had on one of our surface ships for many years. It's our first actual laser we had on ships. So a lot of really cool technology that, uh, that my organization has been involved in uh, really for almost 75 years now for ONR and almost 100 for NRL. But that's what I got for you. Um, you know, a lot of, again, a lot of amazing stuff going on. But I really think the answer is not just to go build bigger, you know, faster great hull ships or black submarines. I mean, will we still need those for a while? Yeah, we will. I mean, we're not going to walk. None of this is like, you know, stop, go to zero and do something else. You got it. It's got to be a gradual thing. But I think there needs to be a, a plan with a trajectory of slowly weaning us off these kind of very highly complex and expensive vessels that takes us into something else. And some of that something else might be unmanned. I, mean, I don't really need to start calling that something other unmanned. It's uncrewed. I don't know. I, we got to figure out what's the right words, but uncrewed vessels, uh, unattended sensors, highly networked together, passing track information back and forth. I think that's more of the future, uh, combined with how we how we make decisions in a more uh, efficient, faster manner than the adversary. Okay, that's that's kind of. I wanted to get that out, and then I really wanted to kind of kick it over to you guys for wherever you want to go with the conversation. Admiral, thanks. That was just fascinating. And uh, O&R living up to uh, its history and your vision, uh, certainly going to keep keep it on that track. Um, we'd like to have our, our, our teaching team uh, get first dibs, and, uh, and our own Steve Blank has got the first question. Hey, Steve. Uh, hey, Admiral. Good to see you again. And uh, uh, it, it was great to hear uh, uh, your summary of the history and what you guys have been doing. You, you know, I, I, I think Chris Brose's book and this whole class has been kind of focused on the the accelerated threats and, and also the speed and tempo that they've been accelerating. I'm wondering if you could specifically and within the, the bounds of a public uh, statement, talk about, um, you know, how is ONR and, and Hondo Gertz's relationship or the acquisition changed of great, we, we now recognize all this stuff and we recognize we need to move faster. What specifically, if anything, has changed to make us move faster to go, you know, I have a line that says we're, we're still great at, we're the world's leader in demos, but still not in deployment. Um, <laughs> when, well, uh, yeah, I tell you. so I think some of what's changed is that, you know, we are actually using, you know, OTAs, other <laughs> transitions. We've been talking about this for a long time. We're finally really trying to drive this hard and we're finally getting contract shops in different parts of the Navy actually using them. I, I tell you, it was uh, up until probably only a couple of years ago, it was only places like O&R that would do these kind of, you know, non-traditional ways of, of buying things. We've now got the big uh, Syscom acquisition shops and contract shops realizing, hey, this, there's something to that. I think that's one thing. The other thing is that we have actually grown more comfortable, some of us have anyway, and actually reaching out uh, to groups like this. So for instance, I've been doing this thing called Hack the Machine for like four years now. And this is a thing where I'll, I'll go out to Seattle. I've been up to MIT. I went down to, uh, um, went to, I went to Boston, Seattle, Austin. Uh, what are we did? We got an, I'm missing another one. We're doing one at Georgia Tech. It was going to be this past summer. We're going to try to do it this spring if COVID will allow. But this is where we go, bring a bunch of folks. We come up with a bunch of Navy problems we've got. And we, we basically let, let the students and others that come to these events have at it. We did an out of manufacturing challenge uh, in New York City, with New York, New York City a year and a half ago. And we simulated a couple of failures on a, on a big compressor. We, we actually brought the compressor and we had a broken pipe and a couple other things. And we, we, we let them loose. We said, the only thing you can use is some kind of a mobile device and then your computer. And we gave them a, key, a Siemens uh, 
CAD CAM tool to, to work with. And they came up with all these amazing, amazing solutions. There was another part of the track where we actually had 3D printers printing different things. And then I had another team of actual cyber hackers that were, I told, we told them, okay, we want you to hack in and try to break these printers. <laughs> so one of the teams actually set one of the printers on fire because they were able to kind of set up in a do loop where they, it just kept trying to reset itself so much that it basically burned out a bunch of resistors inside. So it, it's cool stuff like that. But so, I mean, we're getting more comfortable doing these kind of things. And we, and we obviously don't share the, you know, the, all the, all the secrets, but we were able to kind of lean forward on some things to get outside thinking, because again, I just think we're, we're so inside of ourselves and we're so bureaucratic that we've got to look outside for solutions. This morning, uh, Hondo and I did a, actually we did a press event uh, with Jimmy Smith, a small business guy for the Navy. And we had, a, we were talking about small business. And I was just talking about the value of America's small business enterprise and how critical that is to the innovation engine as well as the economic engine for the nation. And we've got to keep that, that healthy. And during COVID, we've been really aggressive trying to find ways to ensure they stay afloat because this is obviously a hard time for folks. But those folks are critical to our success as well. And we have to be open to it. And we've got to stop going to them and saying, hey, we need a right threaded, you know, widget that goes 10 knots. We got to go, hey, what do you got? What are you thinking? Let, let's see if that'll solve my problem without trying to define what it is we want, because I think we do that too much and we end up getting what we want, but it's not what we should be going after. We should be asking different questions and letting them give us some ideas without constraining them to a, a freaking box that's this big and it has to fit inside or else we won't even talk about it. That's crazy. So- a roundabout way to answer your question. That, that was an awesome answer. And uh, uh, Joe and Raj, uh, questions from you and the, and the students? Raj, any, I, I know you were having some comms challenge. Raj, are you, uh, are you with us? Um, no, I mean, Steve basically asked the question okay. I wanted to ask if okay. what's changing. Yeah, we'll get, so, yeah. Go ahead. Well, okay. folks so, uh, actually, we, I saw a great one from, uh, from John Mernis right on top. Why don't, why don't we go to you, John? Thank you. And uh, thank you for joining us, Admiral. Uh, first off, I wanted to say I've read actually a lot of the uh, cognitive attention work the uh, Naval Research Lab has done. I think it's awesome and should be more widely uh, distributed amongst the AI community. Uh, but my question is, uh, my question is with regards to cross-functional capabilities. Um, how do you think about um, kind of the development of technologies that cross the traditional functional bounds? Uh, I thinking specifically of cyber capabilities to defend attacks on Kind of critical Navy shipboard systems. Um, how do you try to encourage organizations and, and communities of people that maybe aren't used to working together to work together and to overcome maybe some of the institutional inertias that are that exist there? Well, okay, you got a couple aspects of your question. One is how do you get these folks together to solve solve these hard problems? So, uh, okay, I got, got another one I'm going to give you here. So, General Stanley McChrystal, team of teams. Okay, uh, another great read. The way General McChrystal talks about how he fought the fight in the Middle East uh, is, is it's amazing. So hard problem, like you're describing, really hard problem. What do we typically do? We go, we go inward. We try to find our, our smart folks in our own organizations that are somewhat constrained and tainted by the problem set already because they've lived it, they're inside of it, right? Uh, what, what McChrystal realized was that the value, the value of, of the team of teams was that the answers are not all inside my team. They may be in your team or your team, or your team. The, the value or the, the power is how do you net them all together? And so he used to do the same. Every single day, he would have this VTC. And he had, a, I forget who he had doing it, but he had one guy as like the, what do you call him too? It was like the moderator who kind of ran the meeting. It wasn't him because he, he wanted to be able to kind of listen and, and comment and you know smirk on his face so people could see what he was thinking his body language. But this other person was masterful the way they ran the meeting. And it had a very loose agenda. Right? They would have a bunch of topics they would go over every day, kind of the set stuff you would do at an ops brief. And then they would have maybe someone give a problem statement and maybe a little bit of a brief, but then they let it go to the teams, the teams, not the team. And they, you, the main the synergy, the interactions of thought, uh, it was incredible. And that is a model that I'm trying to figure out how to bring that to my own ecosystem and then net in all the other teams around me, whether they're different warfare centers or different parts of the Navy, Army, Air Force, whoever, industry, academia, because that's the power. If you think about innovation today, think about innovation. Okay, there's there's a book I read, not it's a long time ago now, uh, what was it called? Amy Wilkinson, um, Creator's Code. She talks about three types of innovation. One is kind of the aha moment. 
Okay, this is, I jokingly talk about the doc in, in uh, Back to the Future. He hits his head on the sink and boom, the flux capacitor comes to his mind, right? Well, the reality is he'd been working on it for freaking his entire life. But there was something that happened and it's probably some outside thought or, you know, he literally bumped his head and he, all of a sudden it all came together for him, okay? I find in my experience, in, you know, my experience in the Navy, when that, when you have a really hard problem, you've been thinking about it for a long, long time, it usually takes someone coming in it doesn't look like you, doesn't think like you, doesn't do what you do, who looks at you and goes, wait, what about this? And you go, wow, that's it, right? And that's the value of diversity, diversity of teams, diversity of thought, diverse, every kind of diversity you can think of, color, sexual, I don't care, all of it, it's all powerful. And that's, you've got to harness that in those teams as well, okay? So, uh, okay, that was the first type of innovation. Second type of innovation, you take an idea from one part of your life to another, from one part of the world to another. Howard Schultz, Italy, when he's in college or something, he's outside a cafe, sipping cappuccino, and he realizes that all these people are just hanging out, talking, reading. Wait, I wonder if they'll work back in Seattle. Okay, Starbucks is born, right? And then third type, and this is the point I'm getting after here, is kind of this uh, combinatorial innovation. You take many, many ideas and you put them together and you get bigger and better ideas. That's where team of teams, I think, really can play. Because the more we can net ourselves together, talking about issues and concerns, and letting people just kind of spitball ideas, you gotta make it safe for them to talk. You gotta be very, very careful how you do this because everyone's, you gotta feel safe to be able to just put stuff out there. But if you got a good leader, you got a good moderator, you can do that. And that's where you get, I think, the most powerful innovations, most powerful solutions to those hard problems. So, okay, I didn't really answer your question, but on cyber. So let me talk about a ship cyber. So what have we traditionally, what do we do? So we're concerned about others attacking our ship. We are. Okay, that's, that's, a, that's, a, that's a pretty much a known fact. It's in the press. Um, so how do, we, how do we traditionally do this? Well, guess what? We try to set up the Maginot Line. We're going to set up, we're going to make enclaves, and we're going to make it really hard to get in here. Meanwhile, if, you know, if someone's inside or someone mails you something and you, you know, accidentally plug it in, you're, you're, you're screwed, Right. I, again, I think we're thinking about these problems the wrong way. We've got to turn our thinking around. And I think we need to use things like AI that monitor networks, look at ones and zeros passing a plane, and they start getting patterns of life. They start realizing what normal looks like. And they're, they're networked into other things like the power plant and other systems on the, on the ship. And when something starts looking different, it alerts you. And it mainly then starts looking at other places and it starts looking for patterns. And I think that's what we need to do to go after cyber. And, and there, believe it or not, there are some people thinking that too, and there's, there's goodness. Uh, but traditionally, we try to put up these fortresses to try to keep everybody out. It's like TSA, you know, let's, let's spend a bit. We're gonna freaking, you know, we're gonna, we're gonna strip search it at the, at the airport and we're gonna make sure nobody can get on a plane with any metal anywhere. I mean, there's gotta be other ways to do this. Anyway, that's, that's, uh, that's, that's kind of how I'd answer that question. Thanks Thank very much. Yeah, you're welcome. Love the uh, reference to General McChrystal. I guess yeah, he's in Iraq. With I actually, I need a call. I, I, I've linked in with him. I need to get, I want to actually get him in to talk to me and my team. I think he's a great, great leader. He's got some great ideas. He's extraordinary. He, he, he spoke at our hacking for defense class uh, last spring, but just uh, American treasure. Yeah. Um, sure. I thought that, uh, or I thought that Myrno had a, a great kind of crystal ball question that I think we'd all appreciate hearing your thoughts on Myrno. Thanks for being here, sir. I'm a former surface warfare officer, so happy to see some Navy representation on the on the stage. You're a target. <laughs> Sorry. So, yeah. Um, so the class is working on a final project that is dealing with questions of operation and strategy that's really pulled from a lot of the ways that Chris Bros frames these problems in his book. So along those lines, my question for you, sir, is what do you hope the fleet looks like 10 years from now? to make it relevant in a fight with a nuclear competitor? Is that a 355 shift Navy? Is it squadrons of unmanned vessels? Is it something in between? I think it's something in between. I think um, I think you will see more unmanned, un unattended. You'll see unmanned and, and unattended things. Uh, they'll be networked together. I think initially what you're gonna see, uh, and again, this is just, I think this is the way we just tend to do things as human beings when it comes to new tech, is we take the new tech and we kind of jam it into a form factor of something we kind of know. It feels kind of like something we recognize and know. So I think what you're going to see is these uh, these surface vessels, unmanned surface vessels, are kind of going to look like that thing I showed you in the center of the picture. It looks like a catamaran. It looks like something you recognize and know. That thing, whatever it is, whether it's underwater, surface, air, will, I think, initially operate in tandem with a manned platform. Okay, So you're going to have these things as kind of wingmen. 
that'll be uh, you know arrayed around your platform, and you may be able to send it out a couple hundred miles out front to go do some probing of the adversary. Uh, maybe it's got some decoys and other things it can do while it's out there. It'll then come back. Uh, you'll have to refuel it at some point because it's still going to have limited range. So I think you're going to find that 10 years, you'll find many, many more unmanned things out there, but they will be operating kind of close to the, you know, the gray hole or the black hole suddenly. Uh, again, but able to go out and do things, but come back. So I think that's step one. But over time, I think what's going to happen is, and it's going to be driven by, believe it or not, the, the younger generation. It's going to be driven by people who are not constrained by the thinking it's got to be a gray hole or a black hole thing. And they will come in and, and go look at us and go, you know, if you change the form factor, you can make that thing, it could be a surface thing, but it could also be a semi-submersible when it needs to be. If you need to get rid of the surface impression, you could just kind of, you know, I might, don't make it a submarine because that's too complicated. That does cost more money, but make it so it just drops below the surface a foot and it can still cruise along slowly. I mean, it's things like that that will happen because again, this, this has happened all throughout history as technologies is, have been introduced. We always try to kind of take it and make it do what, uh, you know, what the old thing did. Photonics mass on submarine. Anyway, so submarines, traditionally, you got the periscope, right? You're looking through the barrel. It's got the mirrors and the glass. And it's got the, the, the uh, you know, the prism at top looking out. And you're looking through a circle, right? That's kind of, that's the world for a submarine. That's what I looked at for, you know, 20 years, 25 years. Um, we got these new, really cool electronic photonics masts. Okay. Yeah. Guess what? When you look at that picture in the control room of a submarine, it may be on a big flat screen, you may control it with a joystick, but it's still looking at a slice of the world that's like that. Okay. We, we didn't go, well, you know, hey, if I, if I put just like four cameras up there, or maybe six cameras up there, and I was able to kind of set them around looking on, I could actually stare 360 all the time. I could have a 360 degree camera all the time. Well, we're just now starting to do that. We started some R&D on that several years ago and it petered out because we didn't have money to keep it going. But now we're back to like, this is ridiculous. Let's get, let's get 360 out of that. That's the challenge of new tech, okay? The problem today is it's going so fast that if you wait a generation to make those kind of advancements, you are so far behind anybody, adversary, other company, whatever, that you're irrelevant. You're irrelevant. So we've got to break that pattern. And some of that is changing some of those organizational constructs I talked about. You know, being back in 1994, we got to get to 2020 or 20. 18 or 2015 i'd be happy with that but we got to get out of 1994 so anyway does that, that kind of get after what you're asking yeah as far as, far as size goes i mean you you may have seen the press SecDef just announced the uh battle we call it battle force 2045 and it, it's it talks about between 120 and 240 uh unmanned things uh, in concert with a bunch of manned things and it talks about a much bigger navy um so we'll see we'll see what happens uh you know a lot lots good lots going to be depends what happens next Tuesday, depends what happens with Congress. I mean, there's all kinds of factors involved in that, that whole analysis at this point. So we shall see. Thanks, Admiral. Admiral you mentioned the importance of, uh, you know, harnessing that younger generation uh, yeah. for the future of the Navy. And uh, Janani has a great question on, on that topic. Jan Janani? Thank you, Professor Felter. And thank you so much for coming and speaking with us. My question had to do with recruitment. I thought it was really interesting how you have this program, for example, where you're trying to predict how people think. And I was assuming a program like that might have psychologists, doctors, people who wouldn't traditionally look at the Navy as a career path. So I was wondering, how do you recruit those people who are traditionally looking at maybe the private sector as their career over to the Navy and in particular to your research center? Well, I'll tell you, the way we, the way we traditionally do this is it. Uh, um, someone like yourself, someone who's in a grad program somewhere, uh, gets involved in some kind of research sponsored by ONR or NRL, and you become a, you know, you come get your doctoral, become a postdoc, and you continue to do that research in some field of study that we are sponsoring. And then you, at some point, you know the people back in DC, a you know, vacancy opens, and they say, hey, you need to apply for this job on USA Jobs. And next thing you know, you get a job. That's the way it happens a lot. A lot of my, uh, my PhDs in my headquarters building came out of academia where they were, you know, got their doctoral degree in some program sponsored by ONR, did postdoc work over many, many years. And then eventually when other job came open or, you know, family allowed them, they were able to move, they came to DC. Okay. Now let me tell you something different here. So COVID has, has taught us a lot of things about uh, how we work. So uh, today, for instance, I was at work, uh, but only about 30 to 35% of the workforce was there. Okay. Most people are working from home. Um, we do some class by work, but we do enough on class that you can do a lot of work from home. So I've actually told my team, I said, hey, I want to challenge this uh, because I don't want to go back to whatever, I don't know if that was called normal back in March. I don't want to go back to that. I want, I want to take advantage of this. Let's find something 
good that comes out of this. And I think what could come out of this is it, I want to be able to hire people, you know, in California, in, you know, Washington state, in wherever, and tell them, hey, you can stay there and still work for me. I may ask you to come to, to DC like once a quarter to do some required training and just to, to, to you know, to do some, something else where we want to actually get together. But I will let you stay remote because I think we, uh, uh, we're missing out on talent. We just are missing out on talent. They did, you know, a lot of people don't want to come to DC and I don't blame them. I mean, I, 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 I grew up in the Baltimore area, so this is kind of home, but, <laughs> but my wife and I are like already thinking about how we, how can we get a condo in Hawaii one day and move there? That's what, that's my, that's our dream. But that's how we do it. It's postdocs usually, um, or again, you you become um, an expert in your field, and a job comes open, and you you see it, you apply for it, or someone nudges you and say, "Hey, you ought to apply for this job at you know, That's kind of how. I'll tell you something else real quick. Well, I, well, I got you. So uh, we're also I've got this big STEM initiative. So STEM, science, technology, engineering, math. So uh, I came into the job, and uh, uh, there's a lot of concern amongst the DoD folks that we've got some issues trying to attract STEM talent. And it's not necessarily for DOD, but also for industry. And I don't know if there's any foreign nationals on here. And I'm not, I'm not, I don't want to, I'm not trying to offend you, but this is kind of focused on American citizens because I have to have people that have U.S. citizenship to get clearances. Okay. Um, so I'm trying to find ways to really amp up our STEM programs. Okay. So I'm calling it STEM on steroids and I'm trying to find ways to attract uh, a more diverse, more women, uh, more diversity into our STEM field, whether it's internships, you know, and we've got undergrad STEM internships and we've got grad internships. And I'm trying to find ways to get more people involved in that that we traditionally don't get because I think that diversity piece I talked about for getting bigger and better ideas, you have to have that or else, uh, or else we're just not going to, we're not going to progress and we need to progress. So I'm really amping up. So um, right starting actually two days ago, I started something called Naval Horizons. And it's actually available for college students, STEM or STEM kids. And if you go into the ONR website, you'll see you'll see Naval Horizons announced. Actually, if you go to the Navy.mil, uh, which is our, our Navy's front page website, it's right there. It says STEM, Naval Horizons. And there's actually a little video by me. And then in it, it tells you how to apply for it. So if you're a STEM college student and you're interested in this kind of stuff, go into that. And there's a bunch of videos you watch. And basically, I, I gave the students a challenge. You have to write an essay to me that basically envisions a different Navy Marine Corps in 2040. What would it look like if you had a blank sheet of paper? And then my team of smart folks, the panel will go through that. And if they think they're good papers, you'll get $200 stipend check for just for, just for doing that. So uh, tell all your friends. So there you go. <laughs> um, well, Sienna's got a great question. I think it kind of gets at what Chris, Chris Bros was, was emphasizing in his book. Over to yeah. you, Sienna. Um, my question is about how do we find a balance between funding exquisite equipment that costs a lot of money and that's very hard to replace with building lots of low cost equipment, but that's less capable, but easier to replace? Yeah, and I think you're, you're kind of go, you're, you're speaking my language because I think that we tend to have this very, uh, uh, you know, big appetite for highly complex, which are exquisite, phenomenal, best in the world, no question about it, cost a lot of money. Uh, to build. And oh, by the way, they cost even more money to maintain over the life of a 30, 40 or 50 year platform. And so we need to get away from that. And I think part of this is a lot of these, these uncrewed things we talked about, these unmanned surface vessels or underwater or whatever, that's a piece of it. But even those, I will tell you, as we have kind of iterated on what the design of those should be, when we send them over to my friends in the Pentagon to develop the we call them requirements, is what we build to, guess what? They come back wanting them to be exquisite too. And so you take this thing that should cost 10 or 20 million and it comes back costing 100 or 200 million or worse or worse. And I think, uh, I think if you could build cheaper in more numbers that are maybe complicated but not complex, that would be just fine. And oh, by the way, I would build them so they're, they're semi-disposable. So maybe you run them hard for 10 years, but you don't, you don't spend a mint to refurbish them. You, you recycle them. You take them back to some yard, you recycle them, you take all the materials out, re recycle it and build another one. And I think that's the way you got to do it. The other thing we have to do is we've got to recognize that our, we, in, this, in this nation, we've got, some, uh, we've got some constraints. We've only got a certain number of shipyards that can build these highly complex destroyers, submarines, aircraft carriers, right? There's very few in this country. So our industrial base is already very fragile. I think 
since we are going to still have to build some of this for a foreseeable future, let those yards build those, those exquisite things as you described it. Okay, let them build those. But we need to go to the non-traditional yards down along the Gulf Coast, Pacific Northwest, other parts of the country, even just boat builders, yacht builders. Let's go to those folks and build some of these unmanned things. And let's give them some money. Let's move some, some of that defense industrial base money around, develop new expertise in different pockets we've never developed before. And let's do that at scale and build a lot. That is, I think that's one of the keys to this reimagining naval power. Uh, because again, we just cannot afford to keep building the same. I mean, if you look at right now, um, if you went right now and asked the submariners what they want, they want an SSNX, which is the next generation of submarine in, in roughly 2035. You talk to my aviator friends, they want the next gen fighter about the same time. You talk to my surface warrior friends, they want the large surface combatant about the same time. Okay, For, well, first of all, that's about, it's about 15 years from now. So by our traditional build design build standards, that means you got to start like right now uh, for all three. And uh, we can't afford that. There's no way we can afford that. You may have noted the SecBest uh, 2045 battle uh, force came out saying we need to go to three submarines per year. So there's a tremendous recognition that we still own the undersea uh, and we need to maintain that dominance. Uh, so building three submarines a year is what, he, what his plan calls for. Uh, but it doesn't call for as many surface ships. It does call for next-gen fighters, and there's a lot of reasons for that, which we can't talk about here. But uh, but it does not call for the large surface, bad, at least not in numbers and not at, not at the same time. We've got to deconflict these things, and we need to build different things that are much less expensive. That's a long answer to your question. Thanks, Admiral. Let's go to one of our ringers, uh, Andrew, a uh, Hacking for Defense veteran and, and uh, leading up our, our course development team. A Andrew? Hey, Admiral. Thanks so much for being yeah. here. And as Joe mentioned, I was in the Hacking for Defense program. Absolutely loved it. And I know ONR has been a big supporter of that. So thank you for your contributions there. Um, I'm curious to hear more about this warfighter performance um, area. You said it was less of an emphasis in the past. And I'm curious to hear kind of why it maybe wasn't as emphasized as the other areas. And um, But it sounds like you expect it to be a big part of the future. And, um, you know, in the class, we talked a lot about different areas of technology, AI, cyber autonomy, that's going to change the nature of war. And so it that sounds a little bit almost counter to that that thread. So I'm curious to hear what gives you that sense that well, it'll mean, be more important in the future. Yeah, it's because traditionally the money, the most of the money went to build those high-end destroyers and submarines and next-gen fighters, right? So that that would be in my vernacular code uh, 32, 33, 35. Not 34, which is human performance. That's that. That's that code was that, that was kind of on the right side of that graph. And so, uh, as a result of that, because those other high-end things got all the money, that's also where most of the R and D money went. So, I mean, that's the money I deal in. I deal in, uh, in early research and development money. There's different flavors of R&D, but I'm, a, I'm the early part of that. And most of that was focused on either another submarine, another aircraft carrier, another fighter. And that's where the money was traditionally going. Okay. And so as a result of that, um, there was very little left to go do kind of the human performance stuff. And ironically, I, I still contend that that is really where we, I think we as Americans have our advantage there. I think, and I think as humans, <laughs> If you, don't, if you don't figure this out, we're you know we're done, right? I think all of us in our personal lives. I mean, I'm sure. I mean, I'm sure. If I talk to the students that are you know swamped with homework and reading assignments, and you guys are slave drivers and instructors, I'm sure. So I'm sure they get stressed out at you know any given day because they go, oh my god, I got to read five books, and I got to write a paper, and I got this, that, and the problem sets, right? And so you, you kind of get full. It's the same thing for me. I mean, I, I get bombarded with emails all the time. I got meetings I got to go to left and right, and I am. I am craving for that white space I talked about on that second machine. I'm craving for that because, I mean, I know that's where I do my best work is, is when I have a little bit of time to think and ponder, maybe read a book and then write, write things down. We need that. And I think right now we need to find ways to get the machine, and in this case, I'm kind of talking about artificial intelligence, to help unburden us from some of those dull, tedious things that, that a machine can easily do. And we prioritize your inbox for you. Heck, I'll even give permission to delete certain things. I mean, yeah, you can do that with rules already. I got it. But I mean, there's more sophisticated things I'm talking about. But unburden my brain from having to worry about half the stuff I worry about and give me time back. And I think if you looked at that graphic where it went like this in 1781 with a steam engine, I think if you change the scale and you go back to kind of this kind of a scale and say here, we're here today, I think we could master this, you know, way to unburden this and give us time back. I think you'd go up again. I think you'd see another inflection point. And I think that's the challenge we have today. How do we get there sooner than anybody else? So we maintain our advantage as a, as a nation, economic advantage, military advantage, all of it. We've got to figure that out first. 
let me say this about uh, about kind of the American psyche and American way we think. Um, there's smart people all over the world. Okay, so my, this is not a statement about we're the smartest. We're not. But we're not. But what we are is we are very open. We are very open. We share everything. Right? Think about Facebook or whatever your social media choices these days. I mean, you know more about your friends and your neighbors and, uh, you know, you may know what they had for dinner. I don't really care, but, but I know. If I want to know, I can find out. There is incredible power in that. Now, there's also, obviously, there's a threat. You know, there's the threat can use that to their advantage. Yep, got it. But I think the power in that overcomes any of the negative, any of the downside on that. Okay. And yeah, they can, they can use that to, to, to perfect a phishing attack against you. I got it. I got it. But I think the power in sharing is the most powerful thing we have as kind of the way our society is developed. Those ideas, again, it's when you start sharing, that's when you get those multiple ideas coming together, going together in a bigger and better innovative idea. That is the power. And that's where the internet helps us. And that's where our American spirit and psyche helps us. And we have got to, we shouldn't run away from that. We should embrace that. And I think that's, I think that's what will take us, can take us to the next level. We just have to let it happen. We really do. Thanks for the question. Thank you. Am I sensitive to your time? So I might take the prog of asking a, one last one. Yeah, no, go for it. I'm, I'm having a ball. So yeah. <laughs> well, love, love to have you. Um, but I, you, know, you mentioned your interest in getting STEM town and just you mentioned your interest broadly in just getting town in general. You know, our best and brightest work on these very important problems. And, you know, our, our experience going back to our hacking for defense uh, experience, which your organization was so instrumental in supporting, you know, we found that, you know, unlike some people thought when Steve Blank and Pete and I developed the class, we weren't sure anyone would show up and take it. You know, it was it was hard, but there was no like pot of gold at the end of the rainbow here, like Steve's uh, famous lean launchpad class, which was about starting companies. But we found people just came in droves because they wanted to work on these difficult problems. And not only that. And again, maybe a sensitive topic, but there was a, a, an element of patriotism that I think we found on, on this campus and we see others. Um, but I guess the, the long way of saying, what, what, how can we get Stan universities like Stanford more involved? You mentioned like your Naval Horizons, but what can we do to get these young men and women who are have so much to offer and have so interested in working on these tough problems and some of them who want to who perform a public service get involved even more? There's my patriotic background. I love it. <laughs> yeah, that's a submarine behind you there. See the submarine back there <laughs> up on the bridge? Um, well, I tell you, so how do you get more involved in this kind of stuff? There are, um, for me, uh, you know, we're trying to actually develop a cadre of, of mentors. So part of this is, uh, first of all, getting the word out that we're looking for talent, okay, um, when it comes to students. So I just, we've done some studies. We actually had a, uh, we put up together, a, we call it a blue ribbon panel of a bunch of very senior um, uh, retired either military or CEOs or VPs of, of research at different institutions of a diverse background, women, uh, African-Americans, Hispanics, to give us some thoughts on how do we attract kind of the talent that we're not traditionally attracting. And some of it has to do with our messaging. So we're trying to get that right. And a part of this we're finding, and this, this really, I don't think matters what your, uh, your background is. There's a, there's a place between middle school and high school and maybe it starts in middle school where we lose a lot of kids, okay? Elementary school, most elementary school kids think science is cool. Uh, and they just do. I, mean, I don't care if you're a boy, girl, I don't care if you're black, white, it doesn't matter. I think most, most kids, there's a wow factor with science and think it's cool. Somewhere in middle school to high school, it stops being cool, okay? And, and that's really tragic. So we are figuring out ways to actually develop a cadre of mentors to actually go into the schools and, and help the teachers and help the students to pull them across that valley of, valley of death where we lose them. So you keep them. And again, I don't think every kid should be a STEM kid. They shouldn't. And, and that's okay. But I think there's far too many that we lose early for the wrong reasons. Either they don't see someone that looks like them you know, further up. They don't think it's cool, whatever. So we're trying to figure that out. So that's one, one way. Um, I think, how do you get involved as a college student or as a, as a young adult and you want to somehow get involved in some of these things? I mean, these hacking events are, are one way. Uh, again, hacking for defense for you guys, hack the machine, those kind of events are a way. And we're, we're looking for anybody and anybody to come in, give us ideas. That's, an, that's another way. Um, you know, my website, be on our website. We actually have, if you guys got, got ideas, you can actually inject ideas to us to give us that. Uh, you know, we're, we're looking to try to energize the base, the folks out there that have ideas that just want to bring them to us. We'll take them on. I mean, it, this is a team effort and it's the team of teams we got to develop. You're muted, or I'm muted. Somebody's muted. 
Um, that would be me. Uh, we couldn't have a, a more inspirational speaker. Or session. You know, our students are about to t tackle these big problems in their final projects. But beyond that, I think they're at a point where you know they're looking for opportunities. And I think you've planted a lot of seeds and really gave us a great path uh, to, to, to serve and contribute in, in a, so many important ways, uh, as is your whole organization. So can't thank you enough for, for making time for us, Admiral. And uh, thank your staff. It was great to help, help tee you up. And uh, um, we look forward to welcoming you back, maybe in person when, when we- Yeah, uh, I, I was